yeah, that we have a copy of it. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is the baseball Big Bang Theory. So a, a reader wrote into the Ask Marilyn column in Parade Magazine to say that his grandfather told him that in three quarters of all baseball games, the winning team scores more runs in one inning than the losing team scores in the entire game, okay? Marilyn responded that this proportion seemed too high to be believable. So it says, let pi be the proportion of all major league games in which a big bang occurs. So <clears throat> first thing we need to have a little bit of baseball um, explanation because not everybody knows baseball that well. And really, if I'm to be perfectly honest, not everybody likes baseball. As, as hard as that is to believe, it is true. Not everybody likes baseball. Okay, so this is, this is what's called, how many people know any, how many people really don't know much about baseball at all? Okay, Angelica doesn't know much about baseball. Uh, I'm seeing so-sos. Wait, Susie, are, are you, do you play softball? No, I play volleyball. Volleyball, okay. Well, who, did anybody play softball on this, uh, in this group? Nobody plays softball. Okay. Well, so um, in baseball, in a typical baseball game, there are nine innings. And you can see here are the innings right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is a summary of some of the key statistics from the game. But these are the nine innings. And an inning is composed of both teams getting a chance to bat. You, you score runs in a baseball game when you're at bat. And when you're in the field, you're trying to prevent the other team from scoring runs. Am I making sense? Yes, okay. So for example, in last night's Dodger game, the Dodgers scored two runs in their half of the second inning. The Padres came up and they didn't score any runs. In fact, the Padres didn't score any runs until their half of the fourth inning. So at this point right here, the score was two to one. Then the Padres looked like they tied it up here in the seventh. So the score is two to two. And then in the eighth inning, the bottom of the eighth inning, the last, the Padres half of the eighth inning, they scored three runs. The Dodgers didn't score any runs in their ninth inning. And so the Padres didn't even have to come to bat in the bottom of the ninth because they were already winning the game. They, all they would do is just pad their lead and that wouldn't make any sense. So does that make sense? What's going on here? Okay. So if we relate that to the Big Bang Theory, the Big Bang Theory, or at least um, the reader's grandfather is saying that in three quarters of all baseball games, the winning team scores more runs in one inning than the losing team scores in the entire game. So to, if we were to apply that here, if that was to happen in, if that was to happen in a, in a, in a, in a game, that means, let's say, for example, here's inning one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and here's the home team, and here's the visiting team, and that would mean that, um, well, let's just, let's not use home and visiting. Let's, let's use team A and team B. That would be better. <coughs> team A and team B. Um, that would say maybe team A scores six runs in the fourth inning and team B scores two, one, and one. Well, team A has scored more runs in one inning, the winning team, team A, more runs in one inning than the losing team scored in the whole game. Does that make sense here, what I'm saying? Are we okay with this? Kinda? Yes? No? I need some reactions here. Yes. Okay. All right. 
So Marilyn is saying, ask Marilyn, the column she's saying, I don't know. Three quarters, three quarters is equal to 0 0.75. That seems a little bit high to me to be believable. I, I don't really believe that that happens in three fourths of all baseball games. So we're going to do a test of significance to find out. So <clears throat> it says, restate the grandfather's assertion as the null hypothesis. All right. So I'm asking the magic bowl, see if you can do this. Isabella. So the grandfather says three quarters of all baseball games um, have a big bang. How would I write the null hypothesis in mathematics? Um, would it be H zero equals, or H zero colon pi equals 0.75? I think that is correct. He's saying in three quarters of all baseball games, all baseball games being the population here, right? Um, the winning team has a big bang, okay? So that's good. Now, reading the question carefully, what is the alternative hypothesis that we're trying to show here? Kathy. Um, it would be H subtext A colon pi is less than 0.75. That's exactly right, okay? She's saying, uh-uh, 0.75 is too big. It's less than 0.75. That is the alternative hypothesis here. Now, she's not just saying it is not equal to 0.75. She's saying it is not, it is less than 0.75. So she's making a stronger statement. Pretty good? Okay. So, to investigate this claim, we randomly selected one week of the 2006 Major League Baseball season, which turned out to be July 31st to August 6th. And there were 95 games played that week in which we're going to find out whether there was a big bang and, where, where, and where, there, where there wasn't a big bang. So mathematically speaking, what does that 95 represent, Susie? Would it be N? And uh, you, you, with, with confidence. It's N? Yeah, it's N, right? My N is 95. That is my sample size. I mean, this is kind of, there's a lot of games. See, if the, I don't even know how many teams there are in the major leagues. But each team plays 162 games and, and there's at least 20 teams. So you got like, like a lot of games that are being played. We have a sample size of 95, okay? Now, um, can we use the central limit theorem? Hmm. How do we know whether we can use the central limit theorem? We're gonna ask Kaylee. Kaylee, I, I, I wanna know, can I use the central limit theorem? How do I test that? Um, we need to test it using um, that n times pi is greater than 10 and n times 1 minus 10 is equal to, is greater than 10. And n times 1 minus pi is greater than 10. Okay, so that's 95 times 0.75. That's definitely bigger than 10. Because right? 95 is close to 100 and 75%, that's 75. And we have 95 times... Well, one minus pi is 0.25. So again, that's a fourth of 95, which is you know, probably close to 25. That's gonna be greater than 10. So central limit theorem is okay. Are we okay with that? All right, so central limit theorem is okay. Then uh, Michaela is not here. Okay, if the central limit theorem is okay, Emily, what's that tell us about the shape of our distribution? It will be normal. That's exactly right. It's going to be normally shaped. So we know we have it normally shaped. Hey, that's pretty good. 
That's really, that's one of my better ones. Okay, we know it's normally shaped and central limit theorem um, with this kind of a problem. Uh, Crystal, can you tell me what's gonna be in the center here? Uh, I think, uh, ninety-five. No, ninety-five is uh, is our n. Okay. Uh, forty-two point five. Uh, say that again. I'm not sure, but it is at 42.5. Mm, no, no, that's not what's going to go in the center. Hang on, you'll know in just a second. So we know the shape and um, we need the center, the center. Kaylee, again, what's going to be the center? 0.75. Yes, it is. Pi goes into the center. Remember, we're doing a test of significance. So our Null hypothesis, Crystal, think carefully. Our null hypothesis is that pi equals 0.75. So if I'm doing a test of significance, then this is telling me a shape is going to be normal. The center is going to be pi. And then I have to draw the rest of my diagram. Negative one, negative two, negative three. So here's negative three, negative two, negative one. Zero, one, two, three. And, and, and how am I going to calculate that distance between the ones, twos, and threes? Kathy, again, how do I do that? Um, we use the square root of pi times one minus pi over n. Square root of pi, which is 0.75, times one minus 0.75. Divided by n, which is 95. So let's take a look at a calculator here. So I have um, 0.75 times 1 minus 0.75. <clears throat> and I'm going to divide, divide, <clears throat> divide that by. 95, <clears throat> and then take the square root of that. So point, let's call point 044. So this is equal to point 044, and, we, and that's our standard deviation. So that's a standard deviation of our sampling distribution. And, and what that's saying to me, well, let's, let's actually, uh, let's, let's, let's um, draw it out. So I'm gonna have 0.75 plus 0.044 plus 0.044 plus 0.044. And I get, let's do it in black, same color, 0.794. 0 0.838, 0 0.882. And then I'm going to go 0 0.75 minus 0 0.044, minus 0 0.044, minus 0 0.044. And I get 0 0.706, 0 0.662, 0 0.618. So what that's telling me is that if I randomly go into basically the history of baseball statistics and I pull out 95 games and I find out what proportion of those had a big bang and put that on a dot plot and I do that over and over and over and over again. 95 games here, 95 games there, 95 games here, 95 games there. And I plot those on a dot plot. That dot plot is going to have this shape, this center, and this spread. That's what the central limit theorem tells us, which is just like every time I think about it, 
I get, I just get chills up and down my spine. You know, it's just, it's just an amazing thing. All right. So here's our diagram. Uh, let me do something here. Oh, I guess I lost my step. That's okay. Um, now it's telling me, let's actually, um, Let's, let's take our diagram here. Let's take a snip of our diagram since we have such a nice diagram. And we'll put it on this page right here. Very nice. So of the 95 games in our sample, 47 of them had a big bang. I have to say that surprises me. Hmm, interesting. All right. So what is the sample proportion of games in which a big bang occurred? Angelica. What exactly is the sample proportion again? So. Um, uh, um, I want to think of another way to explain it. So if I have a bag of M&Ms and the bag of M&Ms has, uh, has 50 M&Ms and five of them are blue, what's the proportion of blue M&Ms to that bag? You said five of them are blue? So five of them are blue and there's 50 in the bag. Five over 50? Very good, which would be uh, one-tenth. Mm -hmm. Right? So point one, that would be the proportion, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't have a bag of M&Ms. In that, in that example I just gave you, the bag of M&Ms was my sample, right? I have a bag of 95 games, of which 47 had a big bang. What's my proportion? Uh, 47 over 95. Here we go. Let's turn that into a decimal here. 47 divided by 95, point, let's call it 0.495, okay? So my sample proportion is 0.495. And Angelica, do you remember the symbol that I used to indicate that? Can I look in my notes? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, P hat. P hat. That is my P hat. That is a proportion that comes from a sample. What we're doing with this sampling distribution is we're using our null hypothesis and assuming that the entire population of baseball games, pi is equal to 0.75. But now we have a sample and our sample of 95 games we have a p hat of 0.495. So I'm going to put that on my diagram. Whoa, dude. Wow. 0.495. I mean, that's like even off my charts here, isn't it? Huh? So let, we'll just put it way over here. 0.495. And let's pretend that this kind of kept going out this way here. OK. So I put 0.495 on my sampling distribution. And so the proportion of, um, so, so, okay, so, so shade the area under my sampling distribution curve corresponding to the sample result in the direction conjectured by Marilyn. So Marilyn said she thinks that pi is actually less than 0.75. So we're gonna fill in this part right here. This is the less than 0.75, right? It's in the direction away from our null hypothesis. Are we going okay? Any questions? No? Okay, okay. So um, I shaded the area under the curve that, that, that is in the direction of my null hypothesis. And so it says, calculate the test statistic 
and then use your calculator to find the z-score, to find the p-value. So first I need to calculate the test statistic, which is basically what is the z-score of my p-hat? So I need the z-score of this p-hat. How am I gonna find the z-score of this p-hat? Kathy, again, well, of course, this, this is a small class, so you guys get called over and over again. So Kathy, how am I gonna find the z-score of 0.495? Um, you would use the x minus x bar over s, which would be 0.495 minus 0.75 over 0.044. Divided by 0 0.044. That is correct. So let's go 0.495 minus 0.75. And let's divide that by 0 0.044. And I get a Z score. Whoa, man, that is a that is a big Z score. That Z score, that test statistic. So on test of significance. The test statistic is the z-score. It's confusing terminology. I don't like it, but it is what it is. Because I think of the test statistic as being the 0 .6, 0 0.495. That's my statistic. That's my p-hat. But for a test of significance, the test statistic is the z-score of negative 0.5, let's call it 0.580. No, I'm sorry, negative 5.80. Come on, Glenn, get your decimals right. Negative 5.80. Oh, that is my test statistic. So now I need to calculate the p value, which is just the area over here. I have to calculate the p value for this area over here. How do I do that? Emily, how do I do that? Uh, we would use the normal CDF and plug in negative 99 to negative 5.8. That's exactly right. Negative 99 to negative 5.8. Oh, negative 99, since I'm going all the way forever here, the Z score that we use is negative 99. And then my, that's my left boundary. And then my right boundary is right here at 0.495 with a Z score of negative 0.580. Make sure you remember that the arguments of normal CDF are Z scores, Z on the left and Z on the right. Okay, so let's do that. Second distribution, normal CDF, negative 99, comma, negative, 5.8, and I get a p-value. What? What did I do wrong? Oh, I used the minus sign. You know, I hate when I do that. I use the minus sign instead of the negative sign, and you get an error. Let's try again. Second distribution, normal CDF, negative 99, comma, negative 5.8. That'll work. Wow. Wow. My p value, that I mean, really, that's e to the negative nine. That would be like, um, see if it's if it's 3.326, and I gotta go nine, oh, nine digits over. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's point zero 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 zero. Zero, 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 three. Wow. 3.33. 3. That, that's a really tiny number. Did everybody agree that's a very tiny number? Yes, that is an extremely, extremely tiny number. I mean, as a percentage, I, I, I can't even think about that. I, I don't know. That's probably in a hundred thousandths or millions or something like that. I don't know. It's too, it's too tiny. So, my z-score was negative 5.8. My p-value was uh, 3.3. What was it? 3.3. 2.6. 2.6. 
two six times two six, not x. Ten to the negative nine, really tiny p value. So based on this p value. Would I say that the sample data provides strong evidence to support Maryland's contention that the proportion cited by the reader's grandfather is too high to be the actual value? Okay, am I going to reject the null hypothesis or I am, am I going to not reject the null hypothesis? So let's write here, am I going to reject the null hypothesis or not reject the null hypothesis. So how many people vote to reject the null hypothesis? How many people vote to not reject the null hypothesis? Everybody wants to reject the null hypothesis. We are rejecting the null hypothesis. Right. What we are saying is that if the null hypothesis were true, <clears throat> then the probability of getting a value so low of 0.495 is, is so unlikely that we're not gonna accept this as, a, as our hypothesis. It's just too unlikely. The probability, the p-value is so tiny of that happening just randomly that, that we're, we're, we're rejecting the null hypothesis. Make sense? Yeah, pretty cool. I mean, I think it's pretty cool. So we reject Let's write it here. We reject unanimously. Unanimous rejection of the null hypothesis. Oh my God. So Marilyn says, nope. She thinks that the actual proportion of Big Bang games is one half. Pay attention. Using a two-sided alternative, state the null and alternative hypotheses for testing Maryland's claim. So she's not, now she's, she originally said it's, it's less than 0.75, right? And that's what we just tested. But now she's saying, I think it's one half. She, now, she's, she says, I think it's one half, but she's not making a conjecture that it is more than one half or less than one half. She's just saying, I think it's one half. So we now need to test whether or not it's one half. So Magic Bolt, Magic Bolt asks, Susie, what is my null hypothesis now? Oh, Susie disappeared. She was here a minute ago. She got kicked out. Either that or she saw that I was picking her name and she fled. I don't think so. Isabella, what's my null hypothesis now? Um, is it pi equals one half? Yes, pi equals 0. 0.50. Yep. And and Isabella, what is my alternative hypothesis? Um, pi does not equal 0. 0.50. Excellent. Pi does not equal 0. 0.50. So remember, the, the null hypothesis is always going to have an equal sign. The alternative hypothesis is either going to be greater than, less than, or not equals to. And since, well, they're, they're telling us to use a two-sided alternative. You're just saying, find out that it's, that, that, it's not, that it's not equal to it. All right, so let's see. Um, well, we're just gonna we're just gonna do this here. So, what do I need to do? What do I need to do here to start? What do I need to do to start? Kathy, I'm not gonna call you again right now. I'll call you in a minute. I'll put you back in the bowl. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, Sandra, 
what do I need to do to start here? You got an idea? Uh, Mila, Mila, what, what, what do I, what do I need to do to start? Um, you could, um, draw, oh no, you can check the central limit theorem. Thank you. Yeah, you, you almost forgot that for a second, but that's, I got to check the central limit theorem. So pi times n greater than 10, pi times one minus n, no. Mr. Jenkin, you're getting yourself all mixed up. Ignore what Mr. Jank, ignore the man behind the curtain. Let's try it again. N times pi greater than 10 and N times one minus pi, pi greater than 10. So um, that would be uh, 95 times uh, 0.50. And actually it's gonna be 95 times 0 0.50 on both sides. So it doesn't matter. And half of 95 is definitely greater than 10. So green light to the central limit theorem. So Mila, you got that. Now, what were you going to say I should do after that once I said the central limit theorem is OK? Um, you could draw a picture using n is equal to 95. OK. Well, it's, it's n is equal to 95, but that was our other picture was n is equal to 95. So what's going to be different about this picture? Um, the pi will be different. Very good. So the center is going to be pi. It's going to be the alternative hypothesis. Pi is equal to 0. 0.50. Hang on one second here. Oh. Nothing in particular. Oh, nothing. Oh, okay. Can you give me a favor? Since you came up, could you bring me a glass of water? Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, did you hear that? You hear that? My wife just blew me a kiss. Did you hear that? You didn't hear that? You missed it? We'll ask her when she brings me the water. Isn't that nice? You all, you, you, all, you all need to have spouses as nice as my wife. Okay? Remember that. Okay? Don't put up with anybody not, not as nice as my wife. If they're not as nice as my wife, just get rid of them. You know, they're not worth it. They're not worth your time. Don't even date them if they're not as nice as my wife. Okay, so, um, yes. Yeah. Um, I don't, can you um, go over again uh, why the um, alternative hypothesis is not equal to half? In this in this problem, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So there's there there there. That's a that's a, that's a good question here. So, um, when we say this is going to be kind of thank you, my dear. I I, I told them. I told them that you blew me a kiss, blow me another kiss so they can hear. You don't have to see it. It just said here. Did you hear that now? That one? Yeah, okay. I also told them that they should never have a, a spouse who's not as nice as you. I said they shouldn't even date, date anybody that's not as nice as you. Oh, that's very nice. Okay, you can leave now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know whether you wanted seltzer, so I just put it in order. That's fine. I would have preferred seltzer, but that's fine. Okay. So, um, so with a test of significance, my center is always going to be my null hypothesis, which is pi equals something. And if my if my alternative hypothesis is pi is greater than something, then wherever my test statistic turns out, I would shade in the area that is above that, greater than. Are you good with that? And if my, but if my alternative hypothesis was that was that um, pi is less than, um, than, 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 than than something, then I would shade in this side over here. Are you, are you good with that? Okay. But in this particular, but but when I say that my, my alternative hypothesis is that 
pi is not equal to something. So here is my center, which is pi. Let's just say, for example, my test statistic, my p hat is over here. I'm going to find an area on, I'm going to, I'm going to shade in this area over here, but I'm also going to go to the opposite side. So, and, and so whatever the, whatever the Z score is for this P hat, I'm going to use the negative Z score over here and fill in this side. And so I'm adding together the probability of this and the probability of that. It's two-sided. Do, do you understand what I'm saying here? Are you sure you're just not just saying yes? You're, 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 you're following me? Yeah. And so um, how did you know that like the problem was suggesting that? Like, yes. And, that, and, and that's where I was going to go next. The, the way I knew that was because I, I, I would agree it wasn't really written that carefully, but but it did say using a two-sided alternative. So the only one that is two-sided is not equal to. The other ones are one-sided. Got it, okay. Got it, so, and, and that, that's very perceptive, Angelica, because really, I think the problem would have been better to state, um, uh, what's, the, what's the alternative hypothesis? Um, that it's not one half. You know, not greater than, not less than, but just it's not one half. And then you have to know it's not equal to. Okay. okay. But two sided is with not equal to, one sided is with greater than or less than. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, good. All right. So we have our pi. And um, uh, we got to go one, two, three negative one, negative two, negative three. So um, so Emily, uh, what, what am I, how am I gonna figure out that distance right there? What am I gonna do? We'd need to use the pi times one minus pi over n and square root to find the standard deviation. Great. So 0. 0.50 times 1 minus 0. 0.50 divided by uh, 95, and we'll take the square root of that. So I got 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5 divided by 0. 0.95, and we'll take the square root. So um, uh, this is a 0 0.513, 0 0.513. So I'm going to go, did I do that right? Something's telling me I didn't do that right. Um, you divided it by 0 0.95 instead of Ah, uh, Thank you very much. It, it, yeah, it didn't make any sense because I was going to have like, one, two, I was gonna have really big numbers here. I divided it by 0.95, so that was bad. So 0.25 divided by 95, which is my N, that's better. Now I'll take the square root of that. And I, well, it's the same number, but it's two decimals over. I should have known that, duh, you know, right? But it's okay. So 0 0.051, so let's erase this. And we'll call it 0 0.051. So I got 0 0.5 plus 0 0.05 51 plus 0 0.051 plus 0 0.051. So on this side, I have 0 0.551, 0 0.602, 0 0.653. And on the other side, 0.5 minus 0 0.051, minus 0 0.051, minus 0 0.051. I have um, 0 0.449, 0 0.398, and 0.347.
Sandra, do you remember what my P hat was? I must be wrong with Sandra there. Okay. Angelica, do you remember? Oh, you should remember my P hat because you were the one that did it the first time. What's my P hat? 0.495. P hat equals 0.495. So that looks like it fits like right in here, right? Between 449 and 50. I'd say it goes right in here. 0.495. So I have to find out my test statistic. I need the Z score for 0.495. Well, the z-score for 0.495 is going to be z equals x minus x bar over s. So it's going to be 0.495 minus 0 0.50 divided by 0.051. Good, okay. 0.495 minus 0.5 divided by 0.051. And I get a Z score of negative 0.098. Z equals negative 0.098. Eight. And that make that makes sense? I guess it does. I guess it really is much closer. It's a negative number, very close to the very close to the center though. Are, are we okay with what I just said? Yes? So I have to do two-sided. So I'm going to have a line over here as well. If this one is a is a Z of negative 0.098, <clears throat> this one is gonna have a Z of positive 0.098. <clears throat> it's symmetric. Is, is that clear to everybody? Yes? So I need to find a two-sided p-value. It means I'm going to take this value over here plus this value over here. And now I'm asking a very serious question. Can everybody, is everybody totally clear why this area over here is the exact same as that area over here? Are we okay with that? It's symmetrical. So all I have to do is find the area under the curve of one side and then multiply it by two. So how am I gonna find the area under the curve here? Uh, Isabella, what am I gonna do? Um, would you use normal CDF? I would use normal CDF. And what's going to be, what do you want as my left Z and what do you want as my right Z? Um, 0.098 and 99. Great. So you're, 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 you're measuring this side over here. Totally fine. 0 0.098 comma 99. So let's do it. Second distribution, normal CDF, 0 0.098 comma 99. And I get uh, 46, so this right here, proportion is 0 0.4, 0 0.461. And just to show you, if I, if I did normal CDF on the other side, I would have gone from negative 99 to negative 0 0.098. And I would have run, wound up with the exact same thing. So all I need to do is multiply that by two. And I find out that my p-value 
is equal to 0.922 or 92.2%. That's my p-value. So do we reject or do we not reject? How many people want to reject? Reject the null hypothesis. How many people want to not reject the null hypothesis? That's very good. We are not going to reject the null hypothesis because it is entirely possible that I could have randomly got that 0.495 um, uh, 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 proportion um, um, uh, if the actual population proportion was 0.5. There's a 92.2% that I could have gotten something like that. Okay. So I'm not rejecting the null hypothesis. And that, and we're not going to do this. OK. And that is how we end class, almost.